I've also worked with people in the space, uh, not just self-proclaimed, but even recognized as lean experts, uh, global lean experts. And it's a very different experience. It, it, it's, it doesn't feel like a learning space. It feels like a execute or die space. Welcome everybody to a quality podcast season two episode wherever we're at. We are proud to have on our show today, Jesse Hernandez. Jesse Hernandez is the host of the Learnings and Missteps podcast. And uh, Jesse, I have to say I'm a big fan of the structure and content of the podcast. It reminds me of uh, Mark Graven's, you know, My Biggest Mistake podcast. And it's really cool to you know, kind of be in the space where we're starting to move past this fake plastic corporate exterior and talk about, guess what? We screw up. We're people. And here's what I learned from it. Um, so when I heard about your uh, podcast, man, I, w I was really thrilled and I've been listening ever since. Welcome, Jesse. Thanks, John. I, you know, starting it off, and I imagine maybe you experienced, the two of you experienced this to some degree, it was just kind of like, I gotta get, I gotta get this out there, uh, to to break through that mystique, right? The shine of the corporations and the shine of the executives, because we're all just people, uh, and and many of us, you'll listen to the different folks that we've interviewed, have entered, it, did not intend to be in the construction industry and did not intend to be executives or managers or directors. But we got there through a series of learnings and missteps and and also to help people understand it, it in in the industry, there's tremendous opportunity for mobility. Um, and my story was starting off as a plumber and and I've done some pretty fancy things that looking back, it's like, man, how the hell did that happen? <laughs> just just a simple dude, man. And, this, and now we got a podcast, right? So it's it's super cool. Thanks for having me. Well, we're uh, really happy to have you on. I notice you've got a book about Albert Pujols in the background, so we're probably going to be friends. Um, so, yeah. Well, you know, it's it's getting harder and harder to find, like, baseball fans anymore. Mm. Like, I've been a baseball fan my whole life. and uh, John, as a Mark Graven super fan, I have to correct you. It is my favorite mistake, not my biggest mistake. Ooh. Yeah, okay. Um, mm. So we're... <laughs> Now he's never going to come on the podcast, damn it. <laughs> now my that. favorite mistake is. <laughs> my favorite mistake was mistaking Mark Craven's podcast on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, today we wanted to talk about creating a winning culture. Of course, topic that's close to our hearts. Uh, a little bit of my story as I progressed through my personal development and my career, I started out loading trailers for Walmart and I was promoted to team lead because I was the best operator out there. And by best, I meant I was, you know, 22, bodybuilder, you know, athlete and could do the physically demanding work day in and day out and get good numbers. And I did that by being selfish, right? Um, so kind of the worst person you could ever promote to leadership. Um, and thankfully I had leaders, you know, in that operation that got it and kind of put me with the right mentors. Um, you know, I, I owe them a lot for being direct and candid, but also, you know, gentle enough, um, to help me with my self-awareness, right? So then as I, I evolved, I started focusing, you know, on team performance instead of individual performance. And I, I was maybe a little bit disadvantaged, you know, because I wrestled in college and that's an individual sport, right? It's mano a mano. Um, folks that have a, a, an athletic background, you know, in football or something like that, they get it a little bit more. Hey, your job is to protect the blind side. You don't get the glory. But the quarterback doesn't get it either if you don't do your job, right? Um, 
So I started focusing on, on team performance, and that kind of led me into the realm of leadership because I kept noticing how poor leadership was destroying companies or at least holding them back. And Jake and I have some really humorous stories that you know, we try to share in a charitable way um, about some things we've experienced with leaders that were t- literally tearing down value. The company could have been so much more successful, except these folks lacked those skills. But you know, as I grew and developed and you know, became a middle manager, upper middle manager myself, um, I began to see that the reason a lot of these leaders behaved that way was the culture, right? Leadership always starts one level above me, right? And so that got me into the culture game and the psychology game. And I'm at the point now where I have seen the, the benefits in my you know, pursuit of continuous improvement and operational excellence, you know, working with multiple companies, the benefit of the psychology side, the culture side, the people side, the human aspect side. You know, you can give me the best engineering in the world and fail miserably, but you can give me terrible engineering and a great team with a great attitude and a great culture, and I will kick their butts every time. So it's a bigger lever. It's a more powerful lever. It's also harder. It's more difficult. So creating a winning culture near and dear to our hearts. Give me uh, some thoughts on that, Jesse. The first thought that comes to mind is similar path. Uh, I started off as, as a plumber, apprentice, and I got, kept getting promoted because I was faster. And really, I was only faster because I was better at math. So I made fewer mistakes. I had less rework. And, and so my career path was such that I kept getting promoted, and but to the point of, what is it, the Peter's principle, right? Like, I did not have the competency, but because people invested in me and so forth, I was able to develop those things. Now, as my thinking evolved, I started noticing the same thing with the people above me, right? My leadership. And, and it's, it's a, you know, now we're a few decades into it. And many organizations have the same model. You know, we, we put these people in entry level roles where they're responsible for managing things and they get really great at managing things. Like their output is, is dependable, it's predictable, it's awesome. And then they elevate to a point where now all of a sudden they got to support a team, like people, human beings. And, and, and then it, it goes to hell. Like it, it's a freaking mess. And like you said, the, the behaviors, the way they think, the way they function undermine the, the goal and undermine the purpose. It becomes blame games and, and, and et cetera. And when you were talking about, you know, the engineer team, you know, I, I played softball for a long time. And the very first company softball team we had, we had about five people on the team that had never played. Like they didn't even play little league ball. They had no idea what first base was or outfield. And that team, man, we took the league. We, we smoked everybody. And I swear it was because we just didn't know that we weren't supposed to come back from being 20 runs down. <laughs> like, that's not supposed to happen. And, and we could do it. Well, naturally, that elevated us in the league. So we were in a more competitive league. Uh, then we started recruiting better players and you know kept going well at the end of it there was only two or three of us on the team from the original team we had recruited i mean on paper man we had a a bomb team like you just couldn't beat us we could not win a game and it was the same dynamic all of a sudden where you had these very uh high output independent contributors but they didn't understand how to mesh and coalesce as a team in in you know i know that's kind of a goofy example softball field but when i i've been able to work for some pretty big organizations and some small organizations and coach some other organizations of all very you know different levels of backlog 
and that problem is consistent through throughout it, it, it's it's an understanding of or rather it's an absence of a system that develops nurtures and supports this culture that you're talking about uh and and culture is this squishy uncomfortable thing like what are the how do you measure that and what are the metrics and you know all this other stuff the things that are really easy to measure we measure the hell out of them and it drives people's efforts in a direction that undermines the culture we're trying to achieve so it's this counterintuitive thing that that you know i i like spending my time trying to figure it out and most of the time i'm messing it up yeah yeah, so keeping with the sports metaphor, right, uh, teams will talk about locker room culture, right? So on the field, you have to have a pitcher, and you have to have a catcher, and you have to have a first baseman. That's all good. But what good, high-performing teams, whether it is military, special forces, or professional baseball or football, what they realize is in the locker room, you also have to have roles. There has to be the guy that is the shark. He is just dead inside, cold eye. He eats everything in his path. But you also have to have the cut up and you have to have the comforter and you have to fill these roles to have a successful human community. We need all of those aspects of the human um, experience. The uh, movie Predator comes to mind. Um, you know, they're all they're all flying out in this chopper and they, they sort of each have a little vignette in that flight so that you get to know the team you know, yep. before the movie starts. And you've got the nerd, right? And then you've got like the spooky spiritual one. And then you have the dumbass, right? You know, just the dumb jock. Um, that's a really good picture of the culture side that's necessary. You can't have 11 Tom Brady's and have a football team. Mm -hmm. Right. From the personality standpoint, from the culture standpoint, you have to have other personalities and perspectives and ways of dealing with things for us to cohesively come together as a team and get stuff done. And that's where the team of superstars often fails. You have, you know, five type A personalities on a basketball team. Forget about it. Right. You know. Just awesome. I love that. Jesse, you got very lucky there that John didn't drop a Denzel Washington impression. Oh, I'm sure it's coming. We got to bring that Denzel out, baby. Come on. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, so when we talk about creating a winning culture, right, there's some elements that characterize a winning culture, right? So tell me about uh, some of those aspects. You know, the, 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 this term has, I think, been abused and it's almost being diluted at this point. But the, the common language that's out there is, is psychological safety. Um, and, and the reason I say it's diluted is because some people have taken that to mean we're going to be very polite and very nice to each other and everybody has a say. And, and I think that's um contorted a contorted understanding of what psychological safety is uh you know it in my head psychological safety is a space where i can share my ideas and my thoughts and everybody else can share their ideas and their thoughts and given the target or the mission that we're all working to or we're all present for all of those thoughts and ideas are up for consideration and we will assess those ideas and pick out the ones that seem to have or, or potentially could have the best fruit and then act upon them. And if something goes sideways, the leader, because there's always a leader, the way the leader responds is critical in maintaining that community or that culture. And what I mean by that is when a leader responds punitively to, to a gap in performance or, or not hitting the target, like, let's say, let me say this better. <laughs> when, when the leader responds punitively to less than perfect outcomes, 
that undermines the culture. That psychological safety is gone all of a sudden because I am not, there is risk in me sharing my thoughts and opinions. And if I'm gonna get my ass handed to me because something didn't go perfectly, the likelihood of me bringing that back to the next round is gone. Like, and, and then what happens is you end up building a, a, a round table of bobbleheads. And what's the value in that? I mean, hell, there's a lot of places that I've been that, man, they got bobbleheads galore. Yeah. And they'll sit at the table and say, yes, yes, boss. Yes. Great idea. Yes. I love it. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and then they'll get out of the table and they're out at the drinking fountain or getting some coffee and they're all talking smack. Like, yeah. that's a horrible idea. That's not going to work. Like, OK, so if you have this dynamic going on, why the hell aren't we having these conversations at the table? And in, in my experience, it usually can be tracked back to the leader and the way they react to to less than perfect outcomes. Yeah, that's Jesse, a good point. Jesse, do you find that in the construction industry, like perfection is the expected outcome? <laughs> you know, that that is like an oxymoron of, of, if there ever was one. Yes. Uh, so and when I say perfection, uh, we'll talk for clarity. Let's talk about budget and schedule. Right. If if or, and let's zoom in a little bit more, let's talk about schedule. Um, if we say, for example, second floor is going to be done on September 17th at 4 p.m., and the last three items that are going to be done are installing the hardware on the doors, um, caulking around the window frames, and grouting tile in in the bathrooms. Like that to that schedules, and that's way out of sequence. But most of our schedules can be <laughs> that granular. And so, if those three things happened earlier in the schedule or in the delivery or execution of the plan, people will lose their mind. Like, why are you doing that? That, that That's out of sequence. <laughs> it's like, but is it out of sequence? And so, so to the question of perfection, there's this idea that the schedules that have been developed are perfect. And any variation from the schedule from that particular sequence is a failure. And in actuality, it's not the person that design the schedule or even the group that does this design the schedule usually design the schedule a year or two before the project actually went into play went into effect and so many things have changed the the materials have changed the people have changed and the commitments were never secured as to what the appropriate sequence was and the ex the expertise available to execute that plan has gone up so back the, the, the schedule builders was a very small group of people. Maybe let's just be uh, gratuitous and say it was a dozen people, which is extremely gratuitous. Now, there is a limited amount of expertise in 12 people. The people that are actually building the damn thing can get up into the hundreds. And so if you got 100 people versus a dozen, there is a definite gap or difference in the amount of expertise that is available. So when we get to execute the work, that plan, that schedule is not going to be perfectly adhered to. And in our industry, we will lose our mind about that. And it, 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 it's, it's an interesting thing. So yes, yes. <laughs> so listening to you talk about psychological safety, I picked a couple of things out that you emphasized. The first was having a voice. So everybody has the opportunity to share their opinions and that's related to leadership and leadership having the ability to uh, sort of frame what this person is saying in terms of the mission and the objective and the goal right and sort of you know eat the meat spit out the bones kind of thing um, yep. I've heard really well-meaning leaders uh, respond to a suggestion with yeah we tried that before it didn't work Right. Instead yes. of saying, you know, we actually tried that in the past and didn't get the outcomes we were looking for. What are you trying to accomplish with this suggestion? What's your pain point? You know, and digging in and making them feel valued. And, and even, you know what, I had that same idea. You know, 
creating this connection like, hey, you're as smart as I am, right? Mm -hmm. I had the same idea two years ago. I couldn't get it to work. Let's talk about it a little bit more and investing in that person instead of, and it might be a terrible idea. I've had this experience where I have teammates, they just don't have enough knowledge. Yep. They're talking because they want to be part of the team. Yep. And having that wisdom as a leader to understand like the emotional energy in the room can help you be really successful. This person is talking because they want to be accepted and included, yep. not because they want us to use their idea. This person, on the other hand, all they care about is being able to strut around and say, they used my idea. So sometimes with that person, I might not even use their idea, or I might put them in charge of a team responsible for developing the idea to help you know, develop their humility and, and teamwork and team spirit, right? So that's kind of uh, what I heard about the voice, but also the allowed to fail part of it, right? Psychological safety has to include room for failure. And I guess for me, what strikes me with room to fail is failure and success is a, a binary construct that has almost no analog in real life, right? right? If you're landing an airplane, you know, if you're doing open heart surgery, okay, then you have some pretty black and white success and fail options. But for almost everything else, there's a really big range, right? So if we're talking about failure, to even have the mindset that we failed sort of requires that you have some kind of scientific model that defines what failure looks like. And we use control charts and things like that. Um, to kind of help limit reaction. Hey, Mark Graben, thanks for the book. Um, so <laughs> he wrote a whole book on measures of success, you know, how to limit your reaction as a leader by using statistical process control charts, etc. right? A lot of the time, I don't even like the language of success or failure. I like the language of, did we get reasonable outcomes and are we a little better than we were yesterday? That's really the goal for me. Are, did we do it better than yesterday? And do we know why we did it better than yesterday? Did we learn and, and implement? So if you're going to have you know, success and failure, I believe the PDCA cycle, right, or PDSA cycle is really the only management framework that consistently lets people fail safely. Because the mindset of management is we're going to plan, we're going to execute, we're going to study our outcomes, and then we're going to adjust our, our plan next time around. It's this iterative loop. And so, of course, you're not going to hit a home run every time. You're going to fail, right? But without that, like, overarching management structure, man, you're just, you're open to what side of the bed they woke up on that day. Everybody yep. has bad days, right? Yeah, 100%. You know, I was having this discussion with the, some, some other lean maniacs in the construction space, which is a different degree of lean than what you guys are used to, um, it, which is interesting. But anyways, so the PDCA model, there's TAC planning, there's last planner system, there's all these different things. And what I've been trying to, to put my finger on is which of these models are um durable enough such that the human element cannot corrupt it and so far i've landed on none of them like <laughs> they yeah, can all ahead. right they can all be weaponized and, and and so taking it back to pdca you know i've worked with some phenomenal people that understand like the intent is to learn and have we experienced incremental improvement in the appropriate direction? And if the answer is yes, good, let's run it again. Let's make our adjustment, let's run it again. Um, I've also worked with people in the space, uh, not just self-proclaimed, but even recognized as lean experts, uh, global lean experts. And it's a very different experience. It, it, it's, uh, it doesn't feel like a learning space. It feels like a execute or die space. 
Uh, and so again, I, I surfaced that because I agree that in the PDCA model, that type of thinking, the intent is to establish a culture where we are learning and we're improving and we're growing as a unit or as, a, as an enterprise. However, that can also be corrupted and, it can, and to be weaponized uh, against the folks that are actually doing they're the D's, the people that are doing the D, <laughs> they're the ones that get kind of, they're the whipping boys, dependent on the leader. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely worked for many of places where it was do the work, check the employees' outcomes, then adjust their employment. <laughs> 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 definitely been there. Uh, but on the opposite end is I see just as much or more danger out of people that do contort that psychological safety factor and use that to mean we're just not going to have accountability anywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. We're going to be psychologically safe. Do whatever you want. You know, if I need to poop in the aisle, oh well. <laughs> and we miss that fine line of how we create a safe space, but still make it for winners. Yes. Well, I think, I think uh, yeah. back, back to the softball idea. You know, one of the other things I learned in that softball team that, that we put together back in the day was out on the field, the people that I worked with, project man, and it, it was a, it was a, what's the fancy word? Cross-functional team. We had project managers, we had field superintendents, foremen, we had installers, people from the service group. Like uh, the whole business was out there on the field, and I was shortstop because I'm a hot dog, right? And if I laid a ball, like if I just got out of the way and tried to side saddle it, nobody hesitated to tell me. A hey, fool, you need to get in front of the ball and make that damn play. But if I did the same thing at work, can you guess how many people would call me out on that? Zero. Zero. Nobody would call me out on it. And so there's this like this other thing, this hidden thing where I believe people need some reinforcement or some support in the space of just having candid conversation right and then so now we get into the damn word of accountability I, I, I and i really don't know the damn definition but what i gather from people when they say we need accountability is they want somebody to be punished and for me accountability can only begin with me like my commitments to the effort my commitments to to the goal and i've got to hold myself accountable to that you can't hold me accountable. Only I can hold me accountable. And when we display that kind of behavior as leaders, it becomes understood that there, we are expected to deliver on our commitments. And the, the, the gap then becomes securing commitments. How many people understand that securing commitments is a critical role in developing this winning culture? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think the example from the softball field, right, has a lot of meaning, right, psychological meaning about team dynamic. And in particular, you could call what they're doing as encouragement, right? Yes. They're yes. actually telling you how to win, right? I know that you can pull a Michael Jordan and, you know, catch the ball way out here because you misjudged it to begin with. <coughs> Sorry, Michael, you suck at baseball. Um, they, they, that move looked like a Michael Jackson, not a Michael Jordan. <laughs> it was some Michael. But anyway, Michael. Um, <laughs> some dude that wore a glove for no reason. <coughs> um, but anyway. <laughs> When your team says, hey, straddle the ball, right, it's really an encouragement. Like, they're telling you how to win. Yes. Right? Just execute those small things, right, consistently. And it reduces the probability of a screw-up, right? Yes. It's like wearing uh, safety glasses, right? If I walk past you and you're not wearing them, I'm going to tell you to put them on. I know the chances of you getting something in your eye are small, but the chances of you getting them in your eye with your safety glasses are a lot smaller. Yep. 
right? Um, the other thing though that, that jumps out is maybe it has to do with stakes, mm. right? Maybe it has to do with potential outcomes and just the fear that people have over losing their job, fear that people have over putting food on their table and providing for their kids. But in settings like softball, there's much more grace given to your teammates in the way that you interact with each other. So if somebody says, hey, dumbass, straddle the ball, right? You don't get offended. Typically right. it's like, all right, bro, it's almost a term of endearment, depending on the culture. And you know, yeah. admittedly, bros treat each other differently you know, than mixed company, mixed cultures. And these are all things we have to be aware of in a work environment. But we tend not to take it personally. Right. We tend to accept it for what it is, which is constructive criticism. Uh, I can't really control that person's personality or how they choose to communicate. So I take it for what it is, right? But then we get into work and we get offended and, and butthurt over any kind of feedback. Um, and so I think there's a learning lesson there you know, it is different when you're in the in the workplace, but we all also kind of have a responsibility to extend charity to our coworkers. Hey, you know what? They're actually giving me some good advice. Yep. Right? And you can usually tell if someone's intention is to help you and the team get better or if their intention is, you know, to be a jerk or to hurt you. Right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it, one of the things about this being out on the field is there is a scoreboard and we all want to have more runs than the other team. So it's very clear. What are we working towards? What is the purpose here? And when the dialogue and feedback is pointed towards getting us to that outcome of, of scoring more runs or holding them to fewer runs, it's easier for me to receive it. Whereas I think one of the elements in the workspace is it's really not clear what the outcome or what the goal is. And more importantly, if that, you know, we want to make more money, like, oh, wow, you really worked. <laughs> you really put some effort into that one. Um, but how do I, how do you, how does she, how does their function contribute to that outcome? That's the clarity that, that I believe is, is largely lacking and because that clarity isn't lacking uh, or is absent, it's very difficult for for people to receive feedback about something that they did because it feels like just this personal thing. So for example, <laughs> I said early on when I when they first gave me a fancy phone, I think it was a BlackBerry, and I had email, and it, I just got introduced to email. And me and the superintendent, I was the I was the mechanical superintendent on time on site and the superintendent for the general contractor. He and I were always sideways. Right. We were always bumping heads. And um, he sent an email and it, it was, you know, whatever. It was accusational. And I had I had some juice. Right. I was going to get him. And so I replied with pictures of, you know, what was actually happening, where we were, what we were dealing with. But I replied all. <laughs> and I didn't know what that meant. Like I didn't know there was a difference. I'm sorry to all our listeners out there. We had to cut out the section of Jesse doing the salsa. Um, maybe next time, leave your pants on, and we can include <laughs> the family from the podcast. So I thought y'all had a fans only account. That was that was that was for the fans. <laughs> well, we did, but they changed their policy. It's a long it's a long story. Ah, oh, damn it. Uh, and so I hit reply all. And it was in, in Jesse speak. So it wasn't the most polished response. What I didn't know. So my project manager, of course, I got a call immediately. And like, dude, what are you doing? What do you mean? It's like you sent that email. I'm like, well, yeah, like you told me you wanted me to respond to my damn email. So I'm responding. I don't like, what's the problem? Well, the problem was that the owner, like the client, it was, it was a project on base. The client was copied. The CEO of our organization was copied and some other, you know, fancy people on their end were copied. Um, and it, it really, it was a very unprofessional response. Now, back to the point of, I didn't understand. So when he came at me with, hey, that wasn't cool. 
I'm like, all right, well, screw it then. I'm just not going to reply to any emails anymore because you're a nitpicky person. But when after a few days, when he explained, like, look, let me show you. So he came out and showed me. He's like, when you re when you hit reply all, this is all the people that got it. And I was like, oh, he said, well, did you intend for all the people to get that? I was like, no, I didn't. I thought I was just like telling him. He's like, no, no, no. Now they all know it. And now there's there's this reaction of people like we've got the wrong team and we got to resituate people. We got to get you out, get somebody else in. And it, it created all this extra static. And I said, oh, I understand. Lesson learned, right? Don't reply to all the people that you haven't met. Um, now, there's a question about whether he should have copied everybody, but that's irrelevant. My action was the thing that caused the problem. And so I didn't understand how my reply to an email, I thought it was just a frivolous thing. I didn't see how we could had bigger business implications right, un right. until that was made clear. And so the where was the failure? Well, the point of failure is you give Jesse a damn email account and he's just going to use it because he doesn't doesn't know the implications of all the other stuff. And so what was the system? How did we help inform people of this new technology and what it could have and how to best leverage it in a way that achieved the goal that was absent? And of course, we were able to, you know, because of that experience, we designed a system to help educate people on how to appropriately, appropriately use it such that it contributed to the goal. But we don't, it's just an email account, right? What's the big deal? And if we think about all the other functions and tools in business, how many of them are really explained to the operator or the user? How many of them are clear? Like this tool serves this purpose and these, these are the goods and these are the bads and this is how we would like you to use this. Right, yeah, and, and being explicit and clear in your communication you know, as a leader with your team, like you, you can't make assumptions about how everybody else thinks or how they're going to do something. You know, what's obvious to you is, is not obvious to me. Um, I had a, a friend down in Houston and his wife was um, Mexican. And any, anytime he felt like a cold was coming on, she had this uh, soup she'd make for him. And it yep. was freaking awesome. So I got the recipe and I just made it all the time because I loved it. Um, but for her, if you're getting the symptoms of a cold, you make this soup, you eat it, and it, it actually worked. Like it, it would chase the cold off, whatever you know was in it. Um, okay, but not everybody has that uh, family history, you know, of passing the recipe down. And so somebody else gets, you know, starts getting symptoms, and her response is, well, why didn't you eat the soup, dumbass? You know, well, I don't even know about the soup. You know? uh, so it, just a good example of you can't make assumptions that people have your same experiences, think the same way that you do, will solve problems the same way. Um, you know, I would much rather have somebody get upset with me for oversimplifying things and talking, you know, over communicating. Great. That that means we're on the right track. Right. Hey, I'm not stupid, Thacker. I know. Okay, good, good. But do you really know? Repeat it back to me. <laughs> you know, I I'd rather be on that side of the the curve than on the other. You know, where we're kind of guessing and hoping that we're aligned on stuff, right? So I think that's a great segue to uh, you know kind of the second element, major element of creating a winning culture, which would be like a shared target or shared targets, right? So tell me a little bit about what. What is it that makes a target able to be used to create a winning culture? In my head, setting a target, like leveraging a target starts with, or maybe it doesn't start with, but one of the primary elements of it is, is it visible? Can we all see it? And not only is it visible, but can it be digested instantly by everybody that is contributing to it. So often what that means is it may have to be translated as we go further through the value stream to the people that are 
that are executing the work. So, you, you know, and we have very complex organizations and there's levels of management. And, and so the goal may be, may look a certain way for the C-suite, but as we go through the organization, that goal needs to be contextualized for each layer of the organization. Uh, and, and so again, th this goal of, you know, 100% earnings or let's say 12% earnings, our current earnings are at 10% and we want to get to 12%. For C-suite and executives, we understand that. Those people understand that language. Well, what does that mean to the next level uh, of management? Let's say the, the project managers. 2% is a small number. And how is how does their function within that organization, but let's just say department heads, how does procurement play into 10%? Is it 2% across the board? Is it is it 2% gains? Is it just more volume? Is it a reduction of waste? how do we contextualize the goal, the overarching goal to each of those roles? And once we get past departments, the department heads, how do the department heads contextualize or translate that goal to their specific team members so that they understand what it is, what levers and buttons they need to push to achieve that target? Um, is, that, is that too lofty? No, no, I, I really... Um appreciate that the I guess the word that I would use would be something like clarity where mm -hmm. um, I, I put I actually put this in my book uh, how to win right now as an operations supervisor hashtag shameless plug um, but I, I had the <laughs> in order for that to work you have to have a level of specificity right you have to have a common mission Common yes. objective, right? And that has to be uh, made more specific depending on what level of the org you're in or the people you're dealing with. So that you can tell, like the, the CFO, you can say, you know, we need a you know, 75 basis point increase in our hurdle rate. And they're like, yep, gotcha. Or actually, they're probably going to tell you that, right? Right, right. <laughs> That's not specific. At the floor level, you're telling them, I don't want you to make this milk run trip until your inventory reaches this level. That will reduce the number of trips per week by seven, which is this many labor hours, et cetera, et cetera. Right? That's the level of specificity that ends up reaching it. And what John's talking about is in page 30 of his book, Zoom, How to Win Right Now as an Operation Supervisor. Available on Amazon and everywhere else that Satan owns a bookstore. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jeff, I know you watch my podcast. Um, so the target has to be clear. We, we talked about that and, and that is contextualized, clear relative to uh, the audience that you're working with and specific. So you might have something having to do with finance up here at the C-suite, but down at the floor level, it's you're going to repeat this task at this interval. That's how specific it can get to contribute to that. So maybe it's a subset of clarity, but I feel like for shared targets to be effective, uh, they have to be understood. Like the process has to be understood, not just the target, right? Agreed. So the mechanics of baseball to continue with today's theme is pretty well understood because the the target is to score runs and to prevent the other team from scoring runs right and whoever has more runs wins and so you can understand i have to hit the ball and i have to try to hit it where there's no people to catch it right that's how we're going to get people on base that's how we're going to score runs yeah that's um and the a big lever to that visual uh, goals is making it as clear and bright as Jesse's t-shirt. Look at that thing today. <laughs> yep, you get the Style Guide Award for today. Um, however, in business, I found a lot of operations, the process is a black box. Unfortunately, it's often a black box to the leaders. So they have a target. That is an outcome of a system of objects and functions 
that have inputs. And if you want different outputs, you can either change the inputs or you can change the function. But if I don't know what the function is, then it devolves into running around like a chicken with its head cut off, yelling at people, try hard or stupid, which isn't effective, right? That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Certainly doesn't create a winning, winning culture. So the target has to be clear, but also the process to hit the target. And you can't do plan, do, check, act, if you don't understand the mechanism that is resulting in your outcomes because you don't know what to tweak, right? 100%. And, and so that brings the question of what's the leader's role uh, and, and brings us kind of loops us back to the psychological safety thing. You know, I've seen <laughs> different levels of or different variations of, of trying to adjust the outcome where a leader says, well, this is the, this is the way the process needs to be. And the leader has spent time, like hours and hours, days, nights thinking about this. And so they, 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 they got it clear in their head. And the way they communicate it is from now on, do it this way. And people don't understand the purpose and the reason. And they had no opportunity to inform this idea. More importantly, the leader has never experienced the damn work. So their idea is this elevated understanding uh, of, of what the hell's going on. They really don't know what it feels like. And, right. and so the psychological safety thing, the people that know why the process is broken are the people doing the damn work. So the people that can best inform this adjustment are the people doing the damn work. And if when the leader is com committed to examining and understanding and investing some sweat equity towards gaining some degree of empathy for the work, then they're better equipped to visualize the process. Right? I mean, it could just be a simple process map of step A, B, C, D, E, F, and G through observation. But what we like to do is through assumption, paint that picture and say, well, this is where it's broken while I'm sitting with my heels kicked up in the damn office drinking my coffee. But if I take my ass out there to where it's happening and observe and study and then reflect back to the, to the operators, hey man, this is what I'm seeing. What did I miss? And they say, hey, oh bro, you forgot X, Y, and Z. Okay, cool. Well, this isn't work. Like, why do you do it this way and have that type of dialogue? Now we can take that process out of the black box and identify failure points for adjustment. And then the adjustment, guess who gives the best adjustment? The people doing the damn work. Right. But well, we're not exactly there yet. Yeah, great, great points. The, I think that loops back to the contribution and inclusion part, right? Yep. Developing the targets and, and the whole PDCA, PDSA cycle has to involve the people doing the work and it has to include an understanding of the process like you can't you just you, you don't have a basis you can't do continual improvement if you don't know your process like full stop right yep. otherwise it turns into voodoo you know yes if uh, i'm gonna try this i got good outcomes okay we're doing that from now on right i mashed the chicken bones in the bowl and that day we shipped all <laughs> our freight on time yeah. That was what that, I have to do. That's what it is, right? Um, there's no uh, mechanical connection between what I changed and the outcome that I had. But I assume there is, right? I correlate those, even though they're not causal, because I don't understand the process, right? Yep. Um, and then uh, creating a winning culture, right? We talked about psychological safety, which means a lot more than, you know, kind of the the fluffy, soft, feely uh, conversation nowadays, but has to include a little bit of sweat, a little bit of, of action on the part of the leader to make sure that uh, people are included and contributing, uh, that they're allowed to fail. We talked about the importance of a shared target and clarity there. Um, and then the last point that you brought up was celebrating small wins. So 
I, I happen to love this. Tell me a little bit more about that. Oh, it, so back to the Grand Slams. Grand Slams versus OBP, on base percentage. How often do we celebrate the, the, the discipline it takes to take a pitch, to be one and two and take another pitch because it's a little outside? And now you're two and two and take another pitch <laughs> until you get on base. Like you walked. You didn't get a hit. You didn't get a hit at Grand Slam. You didn't get a doubles. That maybe not an R RBI, but you got on base. You cannot score runs if you're not on base. And so that walk is not celebrated. And if we take that to the workspace, showing up on time, and, and let's be more ex explicit about on time, present, prepared, ready to work, all the static is out of our head and we're ready to engage, we're ready to contribute, we're ready to listen, that's being on time. Is that celebrated? Follow through people making a commitment and actually delivering on that commitment. And when I say celebrating small wins, I don't mean a freaking parade. Unless it's my small win, then I want a parade, right? And something that matches this shirt. Um, but a thank you. And, and, and more specifically, thank you for doing X because that action helped me in Y. That is celebrating a small win. And then we can zoom out, right? If, if we hit a goal or rather we, we celebrate the outcomes of goals, what about celebrating adherence to the process that achieves the damn goal every time? Right. Do we do that? Do we recognize those, the leading indicators, what systems, and I, I'm, I'm wrestling with this idea right now. I don't know how to do it yet, but how do we recognize the people that are adhering to the processes that are displaying the behaviors we're seeking before the outcome actually happens. I don't, right. I, I don't know of many examples of, of where people or institutions have actually achieved that. And when we, when we celebrate those types of things, people are more prone to continue that behavior so that they can get the, the, the celebration. Yeah, I think the most one of the most powerful things that I've been a part of in a multi-shift environment was in our hourly board, we just plot what the previous group did hour by hour. And then we have a meeting at the start of the day to knock that out of the park with our shift. And at the end of the day, we take a picture and we'd share it with all of the other shifts in this Google chat that everybody saw all the time and celebrate the living crap out. If I had to shut down that whole operation 45 minutes early, just to thoroughly celebrate that crap out of meeting those goals, guess what? Those guys become winners and over time they forget how to lose. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great point. And I've seen so many companies fall into like the opposite trap, which is the people that are consistently executing are taken for granted. But then when we don't get the outcomes we want, everybody gets yelled at, right? And we're trying to flip that script where your consistent execution of agreed upon processes, the SOPs, is a cause for celebration. And if you're following those processes and we don't get the outcomes we want, why am I going to yell at you? You're doing exactly what I asked you to do. So let's just have a conversation. Okay. The process isn't hundred percent robust. If you find a 100% robust process, please call me because we're going to be millionaires, right? We wouldn't have jobs if processes were hundred percent robust, right? Um, and that really, to me is a great way to end the podcast already up on an hour. Hard to believe we've been having so much fun. What we're trying to do in lean continuous improvement is flip that script. Instead of taking consistent execution for granted and yelling at people when we don't get what we want, like a spoiled kid, we want to celebrate those people that consistently execute the process. And when we don't get the outcomes we want, we know, hey, we were following the process, so now we have to look at the process, find out where we can make it more robust. Jesse, thanks so much for joining us today. Do you have any final word of wisdom or encouragement for our audience? Yeah, give yourself permission to miss the target. Hmm, mm. I, I love that. I think that, you know, in my personal life, 
I've been way too hard on myself sometimes. And I know that's ego. And sometimes it actually inhibits me from growing personally. Yep. So I love that. I love that advice. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Hernandez, host of the Learnings and Missteps podcast. Everywhere podcasts are hosted. Please go like, subscribe, share, all of that good stuff. One of the better podcasts that I listen to. Jesse, thanks for joining us. For everybody out there in YouTube land, goodbye. Peace.